there's no way that we're going to avoid coming back and having this conversation a few years down the road if there isn't some recognition that the occupation and the denial of Palestinian national rights is part of the problem. And we are historically in a cycle that I think needs to be broken. Eugene Rogan, thank you very much for talking to us uh, on the record. Um, I kind of want to start off with this. Now, some say that the history of the region began on October the 7th, and some say it started in 1948. And some even say it started as early as the beginning of the century. So I'm intrigued to know what your take is. Samantha, it's clear that when one talks about the conflict between Israel and Palestine, and in Gaza in particular, there's a deep history here. And I would say that 1948 was certainly an important year because in a sense that's where Gaza went from being a port to becoming a strip of territory outside of the control of the state of Israel. But if you want to go for the roots of the conflict, I would take it right back to the 1880s, the emergence of Zionism, and in 1917, the Balfour Declaration, in which what until that point had been a fairly unrealistic nationalism, Zionism, unrealistic just because the demography involved was diasporic. The Jews of the world were to be brought together to create a homeland through Zionism. That only became a realistic prospect when one of the superpowers of the day, Great Britain, made it government policy to help that project happen. And I think from that point forward, you saw Britain working with the Zionist movement in a way that launched a zero-sum game where two peoples competed over one territory, a small state called Palestine. And I think that the attacks on the 7th of October goes to show the zero-sum nature of that game down to the present day. So why aren't some people actually understanding that, that this actually goes a lot deeper than October the 7th? Well, I think for most people, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is part of the news cycle. And so it's an issue that crops up when there is a hot conflict, and that otherwise it fades back into the background, and people just don't have the historic memory of what, to specialists in the field, is a kind of recurring cycle of violence between Palestinians whose national aspirations have yet to be realized, and Israelis who see the threat of Palestinians as a real challenge to their national aspirations. And in a sense, you know, neither Israel nor Palestine is entirely a natural nation state yet. Israel doesn't have fixed borders. It is continuing a settlement movement into Palestinian territory, and so has left its national aspirations open. And for the Palestinians, the territory that they hope to create their state in is being either isolated as Gaza has been by a total Israeli lockdown, or else by the encroachment of settlements and of the infrastructure to protect settlements that jeopardizes Palestinian claims to the West Bank. And so tensions build over a period of time until you have another moment of explosion. It comes back into the news cycle, and then people like me are asked to come and talk about actually the historic roots of this very long and unresolved conflict. And what's been the reaction every time you've gone on to like a station or done an, in an interview? Are people quite shocked about what you're saying? I think people aware, are aware that there is deep history here. They have the kind of pathé newsreel, black and white vision of a conflict going back to 1948. But all the same, I think this sense of how the status quo is untenable and how we've entered into a kind of vicious cycle, that at some point one hopes these instances of violence will snap us out of and recognize that a genuine resolution of the legitimate national aspirations of Palestinians, as the Israelis already enjoy, is the only way to break that cycle. That there's no way that we're going to avoid coming back and having this conversation a few years down the road if there isn't some recognition that the occupation and the denial of Palestinian national rights is part of the problem. And we are historically in a cycle that I think needs to be broken. Well, speaking of that vicious cycle, there doesn't seem to be any resolve, like you've just said. So why won't the world realize that, you know what, it doesn't take a war it, or it won't take a war to actually solve this conflict? I think the level of violence that happened on the 7th of October, an unprecedented attack on Israel, 1,200 people killed in that attack and hundreds taken hostage, it has been such a shock to the Israeli system. And of course, the ensuing violence against Gaza, which far from stopping at an eye for an eye, is looking more like 
15 to 1 casualty rates. One thinks that we have reached a level of violence in this cycle that might actually wake the international community to the need not to go back to the kind of opium treatment of a peace process that never really results in a two states, but actually to create a Palestinian state. You're hearing this language coming from President Biden. You're hearing it from President Macron. It would be adopted by the British government. It's been standard policy right across the Arab world. It's what the Palestinians want. So the question is, from the horror of what happened, is there a prospect that we could be shocked out of our torpor to actually address in a just and enduring way this long-running conflict? But is it achievable? Where there is a will, it is certainly achievable, but the challenges cannot be underestimated. It's clear that the Israeli government has been deeply discredited and is very likely to change in the near future as a result of 7 October. Similarly, it is clear that the Palestinian Authority has been out of elected mandate for over a dozen years. So there need to be new governments over both the Palestinians and Israel. But in the aftermath of this violence, it is hard to see how more moderate people will be elected in those processes. Israelis, when their security is threatened, vote to the right. And if one thinks of to the right of Prime Minister Netanyahu, the options are terrifying. And similarly, I think that for Palestinians, they have seen Hamas deliver the freedom of Palestinian prisoners, an attack against Israel. That is, makes Hamas standing go up in a way which will make them probably very successful in elections, but that would isolate the Palestinian Authority in the eyes of the international community. So I foresee tremendous challenges in trying to find Palestinian and Israeli partners to achieve a, resol a resolution or to solve this conflict. But if we don't, the status quo is untenable and we'll be back here again. Well, what makes this conflict so difficult to resolve as, a, as an historian? I think what makes this conflict so difficult to resolve is that the territory of Palestine is so small to begin with. And you have two peoples who are more or less at parity in, in terms of numbers in a zero-sum competition over the same plot of land. And the best case scenario for Palestinians is to come away with 22% of the territory in the British Mandate of Palestine. Israel would come away with 78%. But if one were to envision a solution in which a state of Palestine at peace with its neighbor Israel, with open frontiers onto Jordan, were to see the you know, movement of goods and peoples across porous borders in a way which no longer made it feel quite so zero-sum, you could imagine the kind of better future that would encourage Israelis and Palestinians to bury the hatchet against the prospect of a better future for their children. It's only that, I think, that would actually drive the people so scarred by the violence that they have inflicted on each other over all these years to actually move beyond the conflict to a possible peaceful solution. Well, speaking of the anger and the frustration, we've witnessed a level of anger, frustration and hatred very rarely seen before. And it seems like this war seems to be the cycle of hate and violence. How do you see this playing out? I think we are headed for an end of hostilities in the near term. I think there will be great political upheaval in Israel and in Palestine. And I think there will be a mobilized international community. But they will be distracted very soon by domestic political concerns in each of their countries. There will be a presidential election campaign in the United States. There's going to be a parliamentary election in the United Kingdom. You're going to see less than the full attention of the international community as soon as the fighting ends and this moves on to a kind of diplomatic plane. So I think that's where I, the rest of the world, the United Nations, is going to have a real role to try and steer the post-hostility Palestine-Israel conflict into a genuine political phase with a vision, and to me the only vision that might stop the cycle of violence is one that goes straight for the recognition of Palestinian statehood. Not delay it, no more process. And then start talking about the parameters under which that recognized state will then gain international legitimacy. Um, if you don't mind, I just want to have a quick word about the upcoming US elections and President Joe Biden. Um, he's obviously been very forthright in his um, support 
for the Israeli government. How does this affect his chances for re-election? I think for President Biden, the conflict has been really upsetting for his election aspirations. He's aware that the stand he's taken in support of Israel plays very badly with the younger voters and a lot of the ethnic voters and the way that, let's say, African-American voters identify with Palestinians, the way Palestinians identify with the Black Lives Matter movement. So these are demographics that are going to be very important in what promises to be an incredibly tight presidential campaign. And Biden needs them. I think Biden's been a great president in many ways. And I think that for many of us who are looking for justice for Palestinians, along with the support for Israel, he's been disappointing. But I do see that what he says in public may be different from what goes on in his discussions with the Israelis directly. And perhaps in not criticizing Israel openly in the press, he's leaving his team the space to press the Israelis behind the scenes. I hope that benefit of the doubt is real and justified and that we will see a more balanced American policy coming out of this, because if not, America will not put its weight behind solving this problem, needs to. And I fear that the very votes he's going to count on, people turning out to vote and give his shot at re-election, hope, might just be dashed. Would it have looked any different if the Republicans were in power? Well, when we talk about the Republicans in power today, it's very much having Trump back in power. And I don't think that Israel ever had a more supportive American president than Donald Trump. His unilateral actions in changing the parameters of America's relationship with Palestine and Israel, such as moving the American embassy to Jerusalem or giving the green light to the annexation of the West Bank, gives me little reason to believe that a Trump presidency would in any sense be more sympathetic to Palestinian national rights. What are the responsibilities of the surrounding Arab nations when it comes to this particular conflict? A lot of people look to the Arab world to step in at a moment like this. And yet, if one takes a step back, you've got to ask the question, why? I mean, Egypt is often criticized for not opening the Rafah gate, allowing Palestinians out of the Gaza Strip to the safety of the Sinai. But this is not a problem of Egypt's making. It does not have the resources to accommodate 2.2 million Palestinian refugees. The Sinai is a bone dry stretch of land and Egypt is a bankrupt country. And if one moves around the region, I mean, obviously you will have resource rich countries who will have the means and will no doubt be asked to contribute to reconstruction or helping foot the bill. But they keep seeing this as being asked to clean up a problem someone else made. And I think it's legitimate for the Arab world to support Palestinian national aspirations, to condemn attacks against civilians such as Israel has suffered for those countries at peace with Israel, but not feel that while it's at this volatile stage, that it is, if you like, theirs to solve. At the end of the day, it is the responsibility of Israel to abide by international law and how it treats people under occupation. And I believe it's the role of international agencies like the United Nations, if it comes to it, the International Criminal Court, to ensure that international law is applied. But, but I don't is it being know. applied? Why isn't anyone doing anything? Well, the problem is, unless you arrest people and take them before the court, there's really no enforcement of the law. You can pass resolutions in the UN General Assembly. They have no weight. Even in the Security Council, we've known states to overlook the resolutions of the Security Council. And then all you can say is that their actions are branded as being illegal in terms of international law. But I think when it comes to Israel and Palestine, it really won't stop until the United States says stop. And at that point, I think turning to countries in the region to help stabilize the situation would be a reasonable thing to ask. But until then, I just don't think that there's much that they have to do more than, let's say, the countries in the region have already done. We're, we're sitting here in Doha, the only country that was able to negotiate the conversation that saw 100 hostages freed. You know, the, the region does its part, and it's been doing amazing things to try and diffuse the tensions, but it can only go so far. And I, I think the first onus will be on the United States, and then on the international community to get the pressure on the United States, and then for the world to step up and not expect just the Arab world 
to pay for the reconstruction of Gaza, the rehousing of its people, and helping make the resolution come true. Uh, Eugene Rogan, thank you very much. Samantha, for a pleasure. Me. Thank you.